We are uh, today wrapping up a six-part message series. It's been awesome. I've loved these last six weeks called Be Transformed, and we've been talking about God's power to transform our lives. And there's one big line we said throughout the series, the way it is is not the way it has to be. And that's one of the most beautiful propositions of the message of Jesus, that when God enters in to your space and you open your heart to him, he begins to transform you. He changes the way you think. He changes our actions. He changes our attitudes. He changes the way we treat people. He's in the business of transforming us so that we would look differently. Now, you might be here and you're not a follower of Jesus, and we're so glad that you're here. God wants to transform your life as well. And today I want to look at one other aspect that we can see in Romans chapter 12 of what God wants to transform is our future. And I want to talk about how God can transform your future today. Now, the last couple of weeks uh, have been a lot of fun for me. My parents have been in town this week. I've enjoyed having them here. Uh, before that, Stacy and I went to spend time with her family in South Carolina. All the extended family came together. Um, it wasn't family vacation, it was a family trip. I just wanna make sure you know that. If you say, how is family vacation? Because with that many people, it's a family trip, but I love that time. And I wanna show you um, a picture. This is Stacy's extended family here. Um, this is Stacy's parents. Uh, who have been married for over 50 years. Uh, th these are all the siblings, grandkids. And when I look at that picture, you know, there's a couple things that go through my mind. Cademan, our oldest, is 17. Sammy is 15. Karis is 10. Um, you'll also see here another picture of our three kids with my brother Josh and his two kids. I want you to see this picture. And his two little precious girls, they are just dolls. And then our three kids who are also precious as well. Um, but this picture, when I look at it, one of the things that strikes me is there are moments in my life where I'm like, okay, do I really have a child that is about to graduate from high school? Feels weird to me. We were talking about this with my dad. I'm like the age my dad was when I graduated from high school, and it seems so short ago time-wise that I was his age. And when I look back, I can think on the moment when I first held our oldest in my hands, and it, it was just a moment ago. It goes by so quickly. And what happens in life, I think we, we live in the present. Some of us are more futuristic than others, but there are moments in your life where you, you get to the future and you're, you're kind of like, well, am I already in the future? You ever had these moments where you're like, is, is this the future or is this now? Because the present moves so quickly that now I feel like I'm in what was once the future. Anybody ever have these moments? It's like, is, is, this really, is this really the present day or am I in the future? And those moments in your life where you, you recognize life is moving so rapidly. And you're in a season today, you're in a moment today that in the past at some point you, you, you thought I'll be in that moment, you're here right now in this moment. And what happens oftentimes is you'll, you'll catch a glimpse of your future. You'll catch a glimpse of the fact that you probably will be, most of us will probably be living 10 years from now. And I wonder if you could see into the future 10 years from now, would you want to? Some of you are like, no, I don't want to see. You know, I don't, I don't want to know. But others of you, maybe you would want to see. And if you could see into the future and you didn't like what you saw, my question then would become, would you change what you needed to change in order to have a different future? See, so many people live in the present without connecting the dots between the present and the future. And the life you are living today, the person you are becoming today, is dramatically impacted by the choices that you are making today. And in Romans chapter 12, I want to come back to this passage. I've loved meditating on this chapter, and a lot of us have memorized this chapter today. I'm not going to hold you accountable to quote it out loud. Um, you're off the hook. But I love this passage, and the first two verses, there's one last aspect of Romans 12 too that I want to zero in on today, and Paul, who writes this letter to the church at Rome, he says, therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. And I, I want you, again, as I said earlier in this series, to notice the urgency in Paul's words. Notice he says, I urge you. 
There, there, there is a significance. This is not a moment for complacency, Paul is saying. I urge you to offer your whole life, your whole heart as an act of worship before God. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world. You might circle that phrase, any longer. He's saying, don't continue on a path with the pattern of this world any longer, but rather be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. I want you in your notes to circle three words, good, pleasing, and perfect. So Paul is describing the will of God for your life. And what he says is God has a good, pleasing, and perfect will for your life. And that's mind-boggling. You know, I don't don't know what you bring to your understanding of God and how you think about him. A lot of us perhaps think of God as a cosmic killjoy. Perhaps we think of him through the, the, the filter of religion, that God is trying to put on a set of laws and rules on you that weigh you down and make your life miserable, but Paul is saying, God, in his mercy, who died on a cross for our sins, who conquered the grave, is inviting you into a different future, a different way of living, that involves a good, pleasing, and perfect plan or perfect dream for your life. Now, all of us, regardless of where we are in our journey of faith, every day, we are choosing our future. You are choosing your future every single day of your life. When you wake up in the morning and your feet hit the ground throughout the course of the day, the way you interact with people, you go to your work, you you are constantly choosing your future. And the question I wanna wrestle through for all of us today is are you choosing your future by default or are you choosing your future by design? So you can either drift into the future or intentionally move into God's better future for your life. Stacy and I were joking yesterday, talking about how it's very uncommon, I would say there's nobody that I know over the course of their life, that I've seen over decades, that they stay the same. Remember in high school, high school students, when you write in the yearbook, always stay the same. (laughs) The only reason to stay the same would be if you're perfect, like that's the only reason. So God, he can stay the same, but for the rest of us, that's stupid advice. Change, you need to transform. How about put that in a yearbook? You need to be transformed. Change now. (laughs) Start writing that in yearbooks. But think about this from the angle of very few people, when it comes to their life, they just just stay the same. They, They are either drifting into a different life that is miserable, or they are intentionally moving into God's preferred future for their life. I don't know anybody in their 70s or their 80s that I have watched stay the same. I've watched them either get worse or get better. And what happens is you start to see the patterns in people's lives, and I believe the more you read the Bible, the more you see the future. Now, I don't mean it in a weird, like, palm reading kind of way, but I mean the more I see the pattern of God's ways played out in people's life, the more I can look at a life and see the trajectory and see where it's headed. So I'm gonna share with you how I got to this message. I started in Romans 12. I was meditating on it for weeks on end with the rest of the church before the series started. That moved me to Psalm 119. And I was thinking, you know, what, what does God say to us about his word as Paul says, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So I started meditating on Psalm 119. I was there for a couple of weeks and I was reading through some of King David's words. And I, I love how he says in Psalm 119, 99, he says, I have more insight than all of my teachers for I meditate on your statutes. So his contemplation of God's word gave him insight. He could see things that other people didn't see. So he had teachers and religious leaders and others who maybe didn't understand things that he would know because he had meditated on God's word. So I then began to ask the question, well, what was it that David would have had? Because he didn't have what we have. He didn't have Romans. It was written after him. He didn't have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. But what he had was the first five books of the Bible, what was known as or is known by Jewish people as the Torah. And that was the outlining of God calling a people, giving them a covenant, a people that he would bless, 
that the Messiah would come through so that light could come to every nation. So King David would have had the first five books of the Bible, and that's what he would have been meditating on. And the essence of the Torah, or the first five books of the Bible, can be found in Deuteronomy chapter five and six. And I wanna just look at a couple of phrases, but as I was meditating on Deuteronomy five and six, I noticed there's a phrase that shows up over and over and over again. And the phrase is, so that. So as God is speaking to Moses, and then speaking through Moses, he calls Moses out as the leader for the people of Israelites. So Moses meets God at the back of a desert. God is in a burning bush that is not being consumed. God reveals himself to Moses, says, I am the great, I am Yahweh, who was and is and is to come. And he sends Moses back to liberate the people. Moses asks for evidence of how he could know that God is going to bring him out and God says this is how you'll know that you're that I'm sending you when you go in and you come back out and you stand in the same place you'll know I sent you I like that God's like when it happens you'll know and God brings him back out to this place and he's giving to the people through Moses his precepts and commandments now Moses is about to die. Moses knows he's not going to lead the people into the promised land. They've been in the desert for 40 years. He knows in this moment he's got to speak with a sense of urgency. He's got to bring them to what is most important for their lives. And the essence of God's commandments, the essence of God's principles come with blessing. So God is trying to communicate to his people through Moses. And I believe God is trying to communicate to us today, there is a better way. There is a way to live your life that leads to blessing. Watch what he says in Deuteronomy 5, verse 28. He says this, he says, the Lord heard you when you spoke to me, Moses speaking, and the Lord said to me, I've heard what this people said to you. Everything they said was good. Oh, that their hearts would be inclined to fear me and keep all of my commands always so that it might go well with them and their children forever, so that I might bless them, so that they might be established in the land. God is trying to bless a people, but he is using his instructions to bless them. This is important. All of God's boundaries are for your blessing. So God, God doesn't put in place precepts to make your life miserable. God wants to bless your life. He has a good, pleasing, and perfect plan for your life. And if you understand this, it changes the way you see God. It changes the way that you see the Bible. He gives this book to us to bless our lives. And the more we move in that direction, the more of his blessing and his presence we encounter. Now, the other question that I was wrestling through is not just if you could see the future and you didn't like it, would you change? The question is if you could see God's preferred future for you would that lead to change and I want for the next few moments I want to paint a picture of what God's preferred better future is for your life number one God has a joyful life for you that flourishes so God wants to give us a life that is blessed that is flourishing and joy is a distinction of followers of Jesus it's a part of what God was trying to establish with the people that their joy would come from relationship with him not, not any amount of money or worldly wealth or position in society, but that they knew and know the living God. And as a result of knowing God, their lives would be filled with a kind of joy and it would lead to a prosperity spiritually, a blessing upon a group of people. Deuteronomy 5.33 says, so that you may live and prosper and prolong your days in the land that you will possess. Moses is saying, you're, you're, you're gonna go into the promised land. And when you get in there, there's gonna be all these other religions, all these other groups of people. They're gonna be objects that you can pour out your affection on. But if you remain true to the one God who created the universe, if you remain true to him, you will encounter him in a way that leads to flourishing in your life. Now what's interesting to me is so often people who follow Jesus can seem like really angry, frustrated people. You ever notice that? Like you meet Christians who you're like, man, you, you, you seem so miserable. Like you, you are so angry all the time. Who would want that kind of a life? 
Who would want to live in that kind of way? And a part of the temptation that we face is the longer we move in life and the more responsibility that we have and the older that we get, so often the joy is sucked away. We were doing this experiment with our family a few years ago, and at the beginning of the year, we, we pulled out a big piece of paper, like a big cardboard paper, and we wrote down, put a big tree on there and wrote down the fruit of the Holy Spirit. And love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control, all there. And I said to each family member, I said, hey, um, to the kids, what of these would you choose for dad to grow in? Like, what do you want me to be? Where do you want me to be transformed? And all three of them, without the others talking to, without talking to one another, they chose joy. And Stacy chose joy, too. I'm like, I'm joyful. I don't know what, what makes you think I don't have joy deep down in my heart. And it was evidence to me that, that over time my joy had diminished. You know, I believe one of the greatest distinguishing factors of Jesus' followers and the church and the people of God that should set us apart is a kind of joy that at every season of life, every stratosphere of society, every placement that God has put us in, that we have a joy that flows out of knowing the creator of the universe. That if you are in Jesus, your hope, your future is secure based upon his death, burial, and resurrection. Your story is not based on your past. Your story can be transformed based on the grace and the mercy of God and what Jesus did on your behalf. You don't have to live with sin. You don't have to live with shame. If you're a follower of Jesus, you have the Holy Spirit living inside of you. And there's an invitation to a different kind of joyful life that flourishes. And I think about this when I walk through the door at the end of the day. Do I bring the joy when I come in the room? Think about this when we go into work and our meetings. Do we bring the joy into the conversations? Are we the kind of people that when we walk into the room, people are like, I'm really glad he's here. I'm really glad she's here. Or are they like, man, I really hope he doesn't come today. I just hope he gets sick, throws up, stays at home, is on is on Zoom, shuts his camera off, and is on mute the whole time. Because everything he says is negative all the time. And God, God wants a people that flourish with joy. God also wants to bless you as a part of a family that grows over the course of time. So God is trying to establish a family, and his future for you involves a blessed family that grows. Now, when you think about family, there's a lot of different aspects of family because there are single parents in our church and there are some of you that are single and there's some of you that are married and some of you that are grandparents in all different places in life. God has chosen the family is the primary place that he blesses in order to bless the world. So God blesses a heart that blesses a home, that blesses a church, that blesses a community, that blesses the world. And the home is this central place of worship that God wants to bless. If you're single, if you're a single parent, if you're married, God wants to give you and bring you into a family that is being formed and growing over the course of time. So God is trying to establish this forever family, now called his church, so he blessed a nation that the Messiah would come through. Then the Messiah, Jesus, would come and he would establish his church as a place and a people where his goodness can go forth and it would grow over the course of time. And this is interesting because so many Christians, so many followers of Jesus, have their mindset, their obsession on the wrong thing. You know, we're in an election year here in the United States of America. I don't know if you know that. And, and what's fascinating to me is how much Christians will fix their hopes on a candidate. Like one candidate is going to save you. And we've had a lot of candidates and none of them have saved us, ever. And we, we do have one who can save us. And after four years, he'll still be on a throne. And after eight years and 12 years and 16 years, he'll still be ruling and he'll still be reigning. And not that, not that I don't love the United States of America, not that I don't care about policy, not that it doesn't matter, but there, there's something that is so much bigger and more important that you would give your life to. And it's God's forever family. It's his kingdom that outlasts every nation. That at the end of time, there will be people worshiping one king. 
His name is Jesus, and he will be ruling and reigning for all eternity. So God is inviting you into a blessed family called his church. He's inviting you, if you're a father or you're a mother and you have children, he's inviting you to build a home that is blessed with his precepts, with his ways, a blessed family that grows and connected to that blessed family that grows is also also this kind of faith that moves from generation to generation. Now, in Deuteronomy 6, 2, it says this, so that your children and their children after them may fear the Lord your God as long as you live by keeping all his decrees and commands that I give you, so that you may enjoy long life, so that it might go well with you and you might increase greatly. Notice, God is wanting the faith to increase. God is wanting the faith to last. And God is trying to build a family, a forever family, that is connected to, number three, a strong, multi-generational legacy that remains. So what God wants for you is for you to be a part of a story that goes beyond this generation. My dad was a first generation believer in his family. He and several of his siblings made decisions to follow Jesus. I've been blessed by his decision to follow Jesus. Stacy's dad and mom, they, they entered into a family. His dad was a pastor. His grandpa, her grandpa was a pastor. Her great grandfather was a pastor. And over time, what you see is a multi generational family lineage that grows over the course of time. I want to be a part of a multi generational family lineage that my kids and my grandkids are blessed as a result of my obedience to God. That me and my father, that breaking habits from generations in the past and sins of previous generations, that there would be children and grandchildren that are blessed as a result of us responding to God by faith and worshiping him as the one true God. He wants your life to transcend and to move beyond this generation. There are so many people at Saddleback that are first generation followers of Jesus. And I love it. Our church has baptized over 60,000 people people in 44 years. It's unbelievable. And God has blessed one generation that blessed another generation, and now we're starting to see third, fourth, some places, almost fifth generation of blessing in our church. Now this is mind-boggling to consider. If you are a first generational follower of Jesus, God did not give you a faith to stop with your generation. God gave you a faith that he wants to use to bless future generations. And I believe part of the reason why so many people lack a sense of urgency about their decision to fully yield their heart to God is they don't think far enough into the future. They don't foresee what is ahead of them decades down the road. And I believe that there is a call that God is giving to the men of Saddleback Church to rise up as spiritual leaders in our home, to serve our wives, to serve our children, to be anchors of faith that bless our kids and our grandkids so that there would be multiple generations into the future. There are some of you men that feel like you have lost a sense of urgency. You've lost a sense of mission. In every movie you watch, in every show that is turned on on Netflix is downplaying men, and everything in society is, is bashing the role of a father and a husband. And listen, I understand. There had to be a shift in many ways from what was many, many years ago. But God's plan still is to take a family with a husband and a wife, with a father that is a spiritual leader, that pursues God with his whole heart and loves and serves his family to bless future generations. And some of you, you've checked out because you don't have that vision. So you have more vision for your job than you do for your family. You have a greater dream for what kind of progress you're gonna have with a career than for your grandchildren. And God is saying, no, 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 no. There's something so much bigger that I am calling you to. There's so much, something so much greater than a business that you can establish. Yes, build your business. Yes, build your career. But God is wanting to take the faith through you and bless future generations. Oh, I'm so, I'm so passionate about this. My heart is burning over this. Now, I, I want to, I want to. Ask, um, I've actually been feeling like I need to do this for about a month now, 
And I felt like the Holy Spirit was saying, um, are you gonna ask people to obey this weekend and not obey yourself? So um, there's something I'm, I feel like God wants me to do, and I wanna gather fathers and grandfathers to pray for their kids and grandkids. Now, I'm gonna share my email address with you. Please don't share it with anybody else. Um, but if you email me at Pastor Andy at Saddleback or Pasto Randy, however you wanna put it, at saddleback.com and just put in the subject line, pray with dads, I'll send you information to this undisclosed place at an undisclosed time so that we can join together as fathers and grandfathers and pray for future generations for God to bless our kids and our grandkids. I believe God is wanting to bless the home, to bless multiple generations. I believe it's a time for the family to come back to the church, not in culture, not with school systems, not with the government, it's God's. He is a multi-generational God who's raising up the family to bless the world, raising up the church to bless the world. Now I wanna talk about the path for this as we close out the message because God gives his people a path. And in Deuteronomy chapter six, this prayer in Deuteronomy six was called by Jewish people the Shema. They would read it in the morning, they would read it at night. And it was to be on their lips and it was to shape their culture and their families. And I want you to see Moses gives this to the people. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. So God is saying, I am, I am calling out a holy people. I'm calling out a group of people that they will be my people and my name will be on their lips. And everywhere they go, I'll be integrated into conversation as they go to school, as they go to work, as they sit around the dinner table, as they're laying down at night, as they're waking up in the morning. I want to be on their mind. I want to be on their heart. I want to be on their lips. And I was thinking about this from the angle of modern society and how difficult this is to live in this way. And I, I was thinking about, you know, if there was a modern version of this Shema that was written today, what it might read. And so I want to read it to you. Here, O oh people, the phone, our phone, is everywhere. <laughs> Love your device with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. This phone in your hand today shall be with you at all times. All notifications must get your full attention. Let them be on your mind and in your heart. Let your children see your example. When you sit at home and when you drive down the road, right before you go to sleep and right when you wake up, put them in your pockets, your bags, and your purses. Make sure you never go without these devices for more than five minutes. So that, so that, so that your life will be distracted, miserable, out of touch with the voice of God and miss what is eternal all around you. That's, that's the modern version. So the invitation is to be countercultural. The invitation is to be a different kind of people. I'm not saying that you need to smash your phone. Some of you might, but, but what I'm saying is, is God in his word is inviting us to a kind of life where he's at the center of everything we do. He wants us to bring him into everything we do. That's the, the first point on this path, is to bring God into everything that you do. Everywhere you go, let his name, let his principles, let his precepts, let his truths, let his stories, let his miracles, let the things of God be on your lips, in your home. Speak of God's goodness to your children. Tell stories of his faithfulness to your grandkids. Let it be a part of everything that you do so that it's transferring from one generation, one group of people to the next. And in addition to this, God is saying, make loving him the theme of your life. So the essence of these commandments that God would give, the essence of the law, in so many ways the law would show our brokenness and the reality that we can't do it without a savior. 
and that there's no one who can bring salvation. That was the anticipation of a Messiah who would come. But even from the beginning, as God was giving his precepts, God was showing that he is a relational God. So what he wants is a relationship with you. The creator and the sustainer of the universe wants a personal relationship with you. A personal relationship that's not based on duty or obligation or what you have to do. I remember growing up, chores. You guys all remember chores growing up. And having to wash the dishes and the different chores that you would do. Now I do it to my kids. And, and I didn't like chores growing up. I didn't like washing the dishes growing up. Now I love washing the dishes. And the reason I love washing the dishes is because my wife loves when I wash the dishes. And it goes well with me when I do. And, and that love-based relationship changes our perspective. God is inviting you into a so that kind of relationship that involves at the core a loving communion with the creator of the universe. So you can walk outside and you can see a moon that is just glowing this week. And you can look at it and think, oh God, thank you that you put that in the sky. Oh God, thank you for your majesty when you look at a sunset, when you see a child and you hold a baby, or you watch your kids grow, or you see his goodness in creation all around you. There's this loving friendship that God invites us into that is to be the theme of our life. Now I understand, so much happens to war against a loving relationship with God. You know, we go out and all throughout the course of the week, kind of beat up and life happens and there's so many things coming at us and I feel personally like my journey spiritually of pursuing growth is often couple steps forward, couple steps back. Couple steps forward, couple steps back. Anybody else feel like that? And the question is, is not just what do you do on a weekend and coming to a service, the question is the rest of the week. So how do I get faith into every aspect of what I do in my life and every other area that doesn't happen just on the weekend? And one of the things that I've noticed is that if my habits don't change, my life doesn't change. So in order for my life to transform, my habits have to transform. That's why, as a church, we wanna resource you. So everything that we do on a weekend is to establish you and give you tools for the rest of the week. To say, here are some really helpful tools to grow spiritually. Things like, how do you spend time with God on a regular basis? Things like, how do you put God first place in your time, your money, your serving? How do you get into community and connect with other people? Because I've noticed, if I spend time with God in the morning, my day's different. If I trust God with my finances, my finances change. If I put God first in my relationships and do community, my life is different. So when we launch Activate Step 2 this weekend at all of our campuses, we're gonna lay out four key cornerstone habits that will transform your future. I wanna encourage you to go to Activate Step 2, happening tonight at Lake Forest, and you can be a part of that today. You can sign up to join us for Activate Step 2, really to lean into how do I sustain the transformation that I've encountered and experienced these last six weeks. Now, as we wrap up this whole series and we wrap up our time together today, I wanna to just leave you with one final way to choose God's better future, and that's ultimately to pursue God's ways over the ways of this world. To pursue the ways of God over the ways of the world. Deuteronomy 6.24 says, the Lord commanded us to obey all these decrees and to fear the Lord our God so that we might always prosper and be kept alive as the, is the case today. Romans 12, one and two so beautifully captures the essence of this. Do not be conformed to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And as you are transformed, you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will for your life. And for all of us, there is a decision that we have to make today to put our future into the hands of God. He's wanting to bless you. He's wanting to establish you. He's wanting to strengthen you. But without surrendering to him, you don't experience the fullness of his blessing. I am confident that as I stand in the present, that when I get to the future, God will be faithful. Because I can look back and I can see his faithfulness time and time again. 
He who has been faithful in the past will be faithful in the future. But the question for me and the question for you is will you step into his faithfulness in the future or will you do life according to your way or the ways of the world? I have seen in my journey spiritually the ways of the world destroy so many lives. I have seen the pattern of this world with sexuality, the pattern of this world with marriage, the pattern of this world with finance, the pattern of this world with the way that we relate to one another, the pattern of this world with depression and anxiety is eating itself alive. And I believe there has never been a distinction in modern times in my life that is greater between the ways of the world and the ways of God. I believe we are in a moment that God is raising up followers of Jesus that will live different kinds of lives so that he can do something on planet Earth that leads to a global movement of his church, that leads to a global movement of the gospel. And here in the United States, in many ways, it's, it's been kind of like you could just do faith and kind of take it casually and come to church and it was kind of a part of culture and something shifted in the last several decades where there is more antagonism, there, there, there's more opposition to the church and to the message of Jesus. And there have been a lot of people in the last four or five years that have completely walked away from the faith. But I believe what they walked away from was, was not what Jesus invites us into. I think a lot of people have walked away from a haphazard, complacent, apathetic kind of faith. And I think what God is, is doing in our church and what I see God doing in a generation is setting his people's hearts on fire for loving and con being consumed with passion for him. That a kind of surrender that doesn't make sense to the world, the kind of surrender that leads to holiness and, and, and yieldedness to God and obedience to his commands that he might bless it so that the world can look in and they can see, oh, that's, that's what I want. I'm going all these different ways to pursue peace and joy, and I'm getting emptiness as a result of it. I'm getting anxiety and depression, but over here is a God that is standing and saying, I want to bless you. I've laid down my precepts so that it might go well with you, so that you might be established for generations to come. And God is calling us out to say, will you trust me with your future? There are some of you men that are listening to my voice, and you've got this man pride inside of you. And you, you feel like you know how to do it. And, and in deep in your soul, you, you know what's best. But if you are honest with yourself, underneath that, that man pride is a form of insecurity. And God is saying, I know what's best. I'm the creator and the sustainer of the universe. I'm the one who is the alpha and the omega. He's the one who is in past, present, and future all at the same time. He's the one that is standing in tomorrow, inviting you today to surrender to him so that you can step into the fullness of his future for your life. There might be a habit, there might be some impurity in your life that you've just been holding on to, and it was your dad's thing, and your grandpa's thing, and you just think, that's gonna be my story. And God is saying, no, now is a, is a time to break with your past. Now is a time in this moment to surrender your future into the hands of God. I wanna invite you to stand with me. And in just a moment, we're gonna go into some worship. We're gonna sing a, a song about how God holds it all together. And maybe for some of you, when you think about the past and the future, there's a sense of regret. Maybe there's some things that you wish were different. Others of you still contemplating, can I trust God with the future? But I wanna invite you today to put whatever that thing is that you're holding on to. It might be a relationship, it might be a habit, it might be a way of life that God is saying, put it in my hands. Proverbs says this. Proverbs chapter one says, the complacency of fools kills them. What the enemy wants to do is to lull you into a kind of apathetic, complacent faith when there is a spiritual war being waged around you for future generations. 
And your obedience to God in this moment has so much urgency and so much significance. So I say through Moses' words, through God's words, to come to him today and say, God, I surrender to you. You have my whole heart. You have my life. You have my future. Help me walk in your commands and live into your better future for my life. Will you pray with me? If you're at a place today where you're saying, man, I I just want to trust God with my future. I want to place my future into God's hands. Would you just lift up your hand today just as a way of saying, God, I'm, I'm placing my future into your hands. Father, I thank you today with, with those surrendering, some for the first time, but many just coming back saying, I, I surrender. God, we, we put our lives into your hands. You hold it all together. And God, we pray that you would put in us an urgency and a fire for you that consumes our life that we might burn with passion for your glory. God, thank you for Saddleback Church and the multi-generational faith in our past and the multi-generational hope for our future that is in front of us as we say yes to you today. We worship you as the only one who is worthy of all of our praise and adoration. In Jesus' name we pray, amen, amen.